Okay, let's get started. Uh, admin stuff first. Uh, first of all, the final pa prep page is up, has been up for a little while. I just realized we still haven't put the actual exam room assignments on there. Uh, so Davis is going to do that right now, and they will be ready by the end of class. Thank you, Davis. Um, yeah, and so the, the rooms are two different sizes, so the partition will be slightly different from the partition that we used last time. Uh, but basically the same deal. Go to the final room. Uh, you get two cheat sheets for this exam. Uh, and otherwise everything is the same. Uh, if you are a DSP student or otherwise are taking the exam at a non-standard time, you should get an email about that by the end of today. We're still waiting to hear back from SOTA about rooms, uh, but as soon as that does, we'll email everyone. And we do expect to be able to accommodate everyone who uh, uh, has a conflict with another exam. Uh, so the only other thing is we sent out uh, late last night uh, grade reports that contain all of your marks on projects in this class up until uh, and not including the final project or the final homework assignment. Uh, so that should hopefully help you to extrapolate uh, what, what your final score is going to be, what you need to get on the exam uh, in order to get the grade you want in the class and so on. Um, and yeah, and then finally, like on the previous things, uh, there's a practice final that's out, and if you submit that practice final by tomorrow night, uh, you'll be entitled to one point of extra credit on the final exam. Questions about any of this? Okay, if there are issues with your grade report, please, please, please let us know right away uh, so that we can get those fixed. The biggest issue there is uh, not having correctly reconciled the email addresses from your edX account and your Piazza account, uh, but we do need to be able to do that in order to give you a final grade in the class. Uh, okay, I think that's it. This is our final lecture, our final day together, other than the final. Uh, so, uh, no. Yeah. So, sorry. This is uh, this is it, and then we're giving you two days off to just prep for the exam. Um, so. So here we are. Um, we, one of the things that we've been building up to in this class uh, is the final contest. So you know we've been running these things all semester. We have the big results ready now. Uh, before we launch into that, I just wanted to go back and kind of do a brief recap of all of the contests that we've done before this, and you know kind of acknowledge one more time everyone who was who was participating in those. Uh, so we had. Contest one, where you were kind of totally independent of the other person and just trying to go around picking up dots. Uh, the results of contest one were as follows. We had a bot. Uh, these are not slides from this semester. I thought I just fixed this. I think I may have accidentally clobbered uh, the real Project 2 slides rather than. OK. Uh, I do somewhere. Uh, Okay, if you were in the top three while, while I'm getting this ready for, uh, uh, for contest one, if you could just come up here right now so that you are ready to be acknowledged at an appropriate time. Um, uh, are none of them here? Okay, awesome. Uh, uh, okay, this was right after the 4th of July, contest one. Okay, let's say everyone who was in the top nine, oh, come on, top nine on this contest who was here, come up. Everyone come on up. Sorry? Uh, possibly. Okay, good. Well, everyone. Uh, and yeah, so uh, let's have a round of applause for everyone, um, but especially for Robert, uh, who was in the top three and our only representative from the top three here today. So round of applause for contest one. Okay, uh, some of you are probably going to want to stay here. Uh, here is, uh, no, oh yes, this is what happened. Okay, so. Is this actually contest two, or is this now really contest one? That was one. Okay, so I've totally screwed this up. Um, who participated in contest two? Who is not currently standing here already? Okay, let's have another round of applause for everyone who's participated in contest two. Sorry about this. Uh, I realized right before lecture that I had not updated these, and then I updated them in the wrong way. Uh, and so now... Uh, the moment that we have all been waiting for, which is contest three. And so uh, to recap the things that were really kind of important and different about contest three, we were thinking about long-term strategy, 
you had to deal with the other agents now, like in contest two, but you were uncertain about the positions of all of those agents. Um, uh, and, and so you had to use kind of all of the inference stuff that we've been developing in this class. Uh, we had finally a large number of submissions for contest three. We had 17 submissions, which together ran a total of uh, 1,707 matches. Um, there were, you know, we asked everyone to send in descriptions of their bots. Last night, there were a bunch of common themes, uh, such as using HMM inference to figure out where the other team's robots were located, uh, coming up with multiple strategies for, uh, you know, one defense bot and one offense bot, or one top bot and one bottom bot. And finally, I think two or three different groups just submitted the baseline code uh, with no modifications. Uh, and because points to the top 20, uh, all of those people will also be getting extra credit just for, uh, for submitting the baseline code. So well done to all of you who did that. Um, but the great excitement, uh, here are our top three teams in alphabetical order. Uh, we have Test for Alvin from Dubia Ghosh. Uh, we have Yukiho and Ryo Ushi from Ziyang Li. And we have Zuzu is back. Uh, from Robert once again. So uh, those of you who are already standing up here, uh, remain standing up here and everyone else sit down. Sorry, one more time. Oh, you can't see the last one. Yeah. Um, and so we were, we were not able to get descriptions of all of these bots. So what this Yukiho does is still uh, mysterious. And I guess especially mysterious because uh, Ziyang is not here today. Uh, but let's look at some matches. Uh, this is going away. So it turns out that a number of the uh, staff bots did quite well in these contests also. And so the first match that we're going to be watching here is a match between uh, Yukiho and Ryoshi versus a staff bot. And... Some aggressive defense. Oh, oh, oh. And we have a win from the red team. So beating the staff bot. Um, and so it turns out that this is the match for third place, because that beat the staff bot. So we have Zuzu versus Yukiho. Zuzu, which has been on the scoreboard every match, has, I guess, continued to uh, evolve over time. Um, Oh. <laughs> okay, and red wins it. So uh, in third place, the blue team, Yukiho and Ryoshi. And now we have the contest for first place. All right, so test for Alvin wins, and so in first place we have Dibya, and in second place we have Robert. Uh, so the final contest rankings, let's just put them all up, look like this. So let's have once more a big round of applause for everyone who participated in the contest, and congratulations especially to the two of you. Contest questions before we go on. Okay. <laughs> 
that was that was some really high quality Pac-Man that we've seen here, and I hope you all um, appreciate it. Uh, let's then move on. Um, so yeah, uh, one thing that people ask a lot. Oh, just dropped the pen. One thing that people ask a lot in this class is where all of this awesome clip art on all of the slides comes from, and so we wanted to uh, acknowledge our talented artist, Katrina Yim, uh, who I think was a student in this class several years ago and, and has gone on to other things, uh, but who created all of this great art for us. The next thing that we have for you here uh, in the general theme of Pac-Man is a goodbye present in the form of cookies. So let's... Pass these out. I don't know what the most efficient way to um, do the distribution is. Yeah, if we only have one box. Okay. Yeah, all these okay. Sorry? Yeah, not, not quite that. All right. Your taxpayer dollars at work. We have so many leftover cookies. Feel free to just like come up at any point during the lecture and yeah, you know help yourself to more cookies. Come on. For example, right now. Yeah. Come get more. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun to see them all intact. What before they uh, by the time they make get crushed? Yeah. yeah. Destroyed. Great cookie enthusiasm. Yeah. By, yeah, last name alphabetically. <laughs> if you are just now arriving, there are cookies. Okay, well, these are still here if, if you find yourself getting hungry uh, in the next hour or so. So what we have for the rest of today is just more, uh, more advanced topic stuff of the kind that we were looking at last class. And once again, if we wind up uh, running out of time at the or uh, having, having some time left over at the end, we can kind of open the floor up to uh, questions that people have about AI things generally. Um, and most of the applications that we're looking at today are robotics applications, which are going to be kind of a different flavor from what we were looking at previously with self-driving cars. Um, and the first thing that we're going to look at here uh, is an example involving a robotic helicopter. So say we have a helicopter that looks like this, uh, and I think I have to do something special to get this slide to play. Um, we'll just do it right on here. Does this just not work at all? Okay, never mind. So we have robotic helicopters. Here's a picture of a robotic helicopter. In general, they look like this. Um, and uh, here's what they look like, at, look like on the ground. Um, so 
in all of the movies that you're about to see, don't be totally scared because there are no people inside these things. Uh, they're kind of hobby helicopters, but still uh, big exciting things. I think they're about this long. They have gas engines. They will definitely kill you if they land on top of you with the blade still spinning. Um, and what we would like is for to take these uh, remote controlled helicopters and get them to do uh, exciting and dangerous tricks in the air. Um, and like, you know, like the other robotics tasks that we've been looking at in this class so far, um, there are kind of key learning and inference problems that we're going to have to solve in order to make this kind of autonomous helicopter flight work. Um, and the two things here are sort of keeping track of where, it's, uh, where the, the helicopter is located and figuring out how to control it at the same time, right? So like we were looking at with the kind of simultaneous localization and mapping uh, and other robotics-y things of that flavor, um, we just need to figure out from noisy sensor observations where this thing is actually located in the air and sort of how well it's succeeding uh, in executing this trick. And then we also have to figure out what commands we're going to send to it uh, in order to have it, have it keep going through the trick. So the real setup that we're dealing with looks something like this. Um, there is, in fact, a human operator in the loop that's standing here with, uh, with a control pad such that if the computer starts to do crazy things or is about to, to hit people or buildings or anything, uh, the human can stand in and override. And the controls that the human is using to operate this helicopter are really simple. Basically, the two things that you can adjust are the angle that the big rotor on top sits at and then the angle that the... Uh, uh, smaller rotor in the back sits at. So by adjusting the inclination of the rotor on top, you can make the helicopter go up or down. By adjusting the angle of the, the, the rotor on the back, you can basically cause how fast it's going to spin around in circles horizontally. And this is basically all you have control over um, as a human, and so also the computer when we're building a sort of uh, automated agent that's going to be able to do helicopter tricks like this is only going to be able to interact with it in this relatively simple way by adjusting the angles uh, of a couple of different parts. And so in particular, we have our sort of automated helicopter control that's running on a computer that will get passed through the controller that the human agent is operating uh, just in case. And then we're also going to get uh, signals back from the helicopter to kind of close the loop. What kinds of signals can we get from a helicopter? Um, again, relatively simple things. So one of the sensors that's on board this is uh, an inertial measurement unit, which basically tells you... Um, kind of what what forces are acting on you right now. So when the helicopter is in free fall, this inertial measurement unit will read zero. If it's holding itself sort of level above the ground, it'll read one because there's, you know, one G that you're kind of fighting to stay in place. Um, and so, you know, no observation of the absolute position from this thing, but just the kind of forces that are acting on you at any given moment. And then we also have a couple of different sensors that'll give us slightly more information about the absolute position of the helicopter, uh, one of which is basically a compass in 3D that'll give you two angles, uh, sort of, you know, in and out of the ground, how are you pointing, and then north, south, east, west, how are you pointing, um, and, and a couple of other sensors that look like this. But again, you know, the key thing here is we're never going to have uh, sort of perfect ground truth observations of the position of the helicopter. And so one of the things that we're going to need to be able to do in order to control it is to figure out uh, what that position is just from our noisy sensor readings. How are we going to solve this inference problem? I will have some cookie while... Well. So we're not worrying about control for the minute. We're just trying to figure out from the sensors where the helicopter is. Yeah. Is that a hand raised? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what would a naive Bayes model look like? Okay, uh, so the computer's, right, there's kind of, there's the helicopter position and there are our sensor readings, right? So the computer doesn't really enter into this, but this is definitely the right idea. So we, you know, 
let's say we have three nodes in the base net. You said one for each of our sensors, right? Let's call those uh, suggestively O1 and O2. Can people, maybe it would be better if I did this on the screen. Um, come on. Okay, so the suggestion was we're doing something that looks like a base net. We have uh, sensor one, sensor two, and what other variable do we actually care about here? The actual configuration of the helicopter, right? So some kind of state for the helicopter, uh, and what arrows are going to go on this base net? People are going like this. I, I'm going to interpret that to mean these two arrows right here, right where I have two sensor observations. And if I knew the true underlying position of the robot, then I expect these sensor observations to become decoupled. And so in fact, you know, the inference problem that we're dealing with looks like this. We get to observe the sensors, and we're trying to figure out uh, what the hidden state is. Uh, is there anything else I know that will or should inform my belief about the actual state of the helicopter? Yeah. I know that this isn't the answer, but there's probably a person who's looking at the helicopter. Okay, there's a person who's looking at the helicopter, but I don't know how to put the person in my base net, right, without maybe putting sensors in the person's brain, uh, which would, would be some kind of noisy observation. But okay, so not the not the person. What else do we know? Yeah. You have like multiple observations Right, we're moving. The helicopter is in motion, all of these sensors are running continuously. And so what we actually have is we have some, you know. Let's call this h of t and h of t minus 1. And so we have a bunch of hidden states for the helicopter. And how do these connect to everything else with arrows in our base net? People are doing this, which yep, means uh, arrows that look like this. Right, so what we have here is some kind of thing that looks basically like a hidden Markov model, where maybe we're getting multiple different observations at the same time, and we expect that those different observations uh, are going to be conditionally independent if I were able to observe the actual true hidden state of the helicopter. So more generally, you know, we do have something that just looks like an HMM. Um, what information do I actually need to remember in the state of the helicopter? And there's, I guess, some kind of hint on the slide, but let's see if we can unpack what this means. What state do I actually, you know, if I now want to be able to use the state to do control, what do I need to know about the configuration of the helicopter to control it effectively? So basically, I have some state variable here that contains whatever information I'm trying to figure out about the position of the helicopter. Uh, what is this state variable actually? What does the state space that I'm doing inference over look like? This would be a great final exam question. Yeah. OK. So basically, we need to know where the helicopter is right now. How many numbers does it take to specify where the helicopter is right now? Well, you know, it's like physically located somewhere in space, right? But also, angles matter. And whether the helicopter is upside down or right side up is going to influence uh, the kinds of things that, that we try to do with it. So we're going to have, in fact, five numbers specifying, or six numbers specifying the state of the robot, three saying the sort of XYZ positions, and three specifying the angle at which the helicopter is, is oriented. What else might we want? Yeah. Um, so basically, you can move like this, you can move like this, and you can move like this in the plane. Yeah. Exactly. Why do we care how fast it's moving? I mean, intuitively, right? If, if this thing is, I've turned the 
motors off when it's way up in the air and it's just plummeting to the ground. The signal that I need to send to it to stop it from crashing is going to be very different from if it's already been hovering a foot off the ground and I want to bring it down gently, right? So I need to know not only kind of uh, where it is, but also how it's changing. And one other way of thinking about this, right, is just that if I wanted to write down the transition function by hand, kind of to do physics I need and, and to, to figure out at the next time step where this is going to be, uh, even if I don't touch the system, I need to know both where things are located and how they are already moving to figure out where they're going to be located at the next time step. So when we write uh, these variables with little dots on top, uh, that's basically the first derivative of all the quantities on the left, which is going to correspond to what's the speed in the x direction, what's the speed in the y direction, what's the speed in the z direction, and then also how fast is it rotating around these various angles. Okay, so this is our state space for the HMM. Uh, we're going to, for this uh, emission distribution here, going to have some kind of sensor model that, you know, knows for my gyroscope and for maybe some cameras that I have off to the side and for this accelerometer that we had in here, uh, how are those, what, what are those readings going to look like given the actual state of the robot? And then the last thing that we need for a hidden Markov model is uh, some kind of transition distribution. Um, and this is going to be something really complicated, right? Because what we need is something that tells me, you know, Oh, the pencil is about to die, which is a thing that can happen. We'll plug that in while we're waiting. Um, you know, if the robot is in this place at this angle, moving so fast, where is it going to be at the next time step? Well, this is some like weird, oddly shaped thing that interacts with the air in a complicated way, and, and you know, there are only certain rates at which I can change the motors and so on. And so, there's going to be some very complicated function that we're just going to call f here, which is some kind of model of the dynamics of, um, of the helicopter. And because we know that this model is not going to be perfect, because physics is hard, we're just going to introduce a noise term here that we've called W that says basically we think it's going to go, it's going to move in the way specified by F, but we might be wrong and our uncertainty about how that motion is going to happen is going to be specified by W here. How might I build this F function? Yeah. Right, so I could sort of write down a physical model of my robot and I could do a bunch of really hard math to figure out here's how the air interacts with the propellers and here's what happens if, you know, I'm increasing the speed or decreasing the speed or whatever. So one thing to do would just be to sort of sit down offline and analytically write down uh, a model of how the robot's going to move. What else could we do? Yeah. Okay, and so I've run the robot a bunch of times. I have traces of the robot's behavior, and what am I going to do now? Um, then it could be like if the helicopter is in this state, and like I press this button, I'll exit it and wait for the other state. Okay, so you know something like when we were doing model-based reinforcement learning, where I'm trying to sort of figure out the transition function. Remember here that my state space is continuous, right? I have some real number for x, some real number for y, some real number for z. So it's not going to be enough to just say like I was in state 23 and 10% of the time I wound up in state 24, both because, you know, there's a huge number of variables, right? And even if it were discrete, we couldn't write down that whole table, and because, in fact, they are not discrete. So what else could we do? But this is, this is in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But then uh, you could make a, a what was like de decaying rate of value of how much each test of how much each test adds to the likelihood of, of whatever happening in the future. Okay. So and what is what does this look like? Basically, I'm in uh, because this is in the right direction. So I'm currently in some state x, and I have a bunch of tests that tell me you know. Previously, before, I was at some x1, and I wound up in x2, and then I was in some x3, and I wound up in x4, uh, and so on and so forth. And these are all just like big vectors of real-valued numbers. So what do I do 
with my x1 and my x3 to predict where this is going to go at the next step. And what you, what you were saying about something decaying is very much on the right track. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I, I, I don't quite know what that means, right? I'm sitting at x1. Um, so, like, you're sitting at x1, and you observe, like, changing the state to x2, and then you observe, like, the state to x3, and then you observe, like, the state to x4, and then you observe, like, the state to x3, and then you observe, like, the state to x3, Okay, so this is, I mean, this is for some demonstration that I've seen before, right? And now I have some new thing that we're just calling x. And I want to figure out how to use all of my previous demonstrations to figure out where x is going to go in the next time step. What have we looked at in this class before for using a big collection of data that we recorded and kind of looking for similar things and trying to use those similar things to estimate some, estimate some complicated nonlinear function? Yeah. I'm trying, I, I, so I'm telling you we're at state x, and I want to know where I'm going to be at the next time step. And I've seen a bunch of other observations. What have we seen for using lots of examples to learn complicated nonlinear functions? Yes. Okay, reinforcement, is this a reinforcement learning setup, though? Right, I kind of, I have all of the recordings that I've made already. We could definitely do this with reinforcement learning, and we'll come to that in a minute. But right now I'm just trying to get a transition model, and I'm not actually figuring out how to do control. So where is this transition model going to come from? How am I going to represent it, basically, if I've already observed a bunch of other trajectories that look like this? Yeah. Exactly, right? This is just some kind of machine learning problem where my inputs are my states now and my outputs, or maybe, you know, my states and my controls right now, and my out outputs are my states at the next time step. Uh, sorry, right? So input here, output here, and this is just some kind of function that I'm trying to learn from data. And we could do that with a neural network. We could do that with some kind of nearest neighbors or kernel-based approach, right? Any of the things that we've seen in this class for solving machine learning as a classification problem, you can just drop in right here and say, what I want to predict from this x at time t is x at time t plus 1, given everything that we've observed so far. So we can acquire this transition model from data. And this is a really powerful thing, and we're going to look at it in a minute. Okay, so now we have our questions about what we've done here. Yeah. So we have a bunch of like, uh, observations, and then like, so from there we have we get probability. Yeah, I mean you could either try to learn a probability distribution, or you could, and so like when we were looking at the softmax loss in the second neural nets lecture, right? That's something where you're sort of learning to predict the right conditional probability distribution. We could use a similar loss here if you want a distribution over next states, or you could even just learn some kind of deterministic thing. Um, although in practice that's going to be less useful. Another question. You know, we can always know where the helicopter is if it's smashing. Uh, yes, but then it won't do fancy tricks. And we're trying to get it to do fancy tricks. We'll look at some videos of fancy tricks in a minute. OK. Question? No. OK. Um, so this is solving the, the problem of inferring where the helicopter is located. But at the end of the day, what we do actually want to do is figure out how to control it. And at this point, this looks, look, looks more like an MDP, right? Where I have some kind of state space. I have some set of actions that are available to me that will uh, control how the robot works. I have now my transition dynamics, which I've learned maybe from data, which I've 
produced maybe just by writing down physics by hand. Um, what else, what's the last thing that we're going to need to solve this MDP? Yeah, a reward function. Excellent. So what kind of reward would be appropriate, say, if I just want to get the helicopter to hover at some fixed position in space? So I'm going to design my reward function. It takes in a state, and it's going to output some score. And basically, what is the reward function I should choose so that this hovering behavior is the optimal policy? Yeah. OK, good. So one thing we want is all of the speed things to be 0. What's the other thing that we want? Right, it's like close to the actual point in space that we're trying to sit. So we can either do that by making you know, things that are close to that really big, or things that are far from that really small. And so this is exactly what you said here, but with a negative sign in front of it, right? That there's going to be a penalty for deviating from my target position x star, and there's going to be a penalty for having any of these speeds deviate from zero. Um, and so sure enough, if we do something like this, So we can get the helicopter to hover in place, and it turns out we can even get the helicopter to hover in place upside down, uh, which is pretty cool, right? And we do that just by setting our target uh, for those uh, angle variables to, to the right sign. Question? Um, so uh, right here. Um, so what else could we plug in there? Like, what, what would be another reward that we might want to use instead of squaring them? So when you had suggested a reward before, and you said we were going to, you know, give it a high reward for being close to the target and a low reward for being far away, how do we implement that? Sorry? Right, what this says is that basically if x is too far away in one direction or too far in the other direction, uh, then this whole quantity will be positive. So with a negative sign out in front, the whole reward is negative. Um, so I guess the sort of short answer to that question is that there are lots of other reward functions you could define that will have this property, right? We could also penalize uh, the absolute value of the distance between x and x squared. Um, the sort of slightly more complicated answer to that question is that even in continuous state spaces, if all of your rewards um, are quadratic like this, then it's really easy to calculate the optimal policy um, under certain assumptions. And so, uh, of, yeah, of all rewards that this are shape, that are this shape, quadratic rewards happen to work out nicely mathematically. But the key thing here is just we do want it to be the case that if you deviate in either direction, you get this kind of penalty. Right, and what we have down here is just like x dot minus 0, uh, which is where those come from. OK, uh, so there's that. Um, and so this will work for hovering. But now let's say we want to do something a lot more complicated, like uh, flipping upside down. So I want this helicopter to be able to like execute a loop in the air. And I still want to have this work by basically I'm going to write down some reward function such that the optimal policy in this MDP that we've specified um, causes me to, uh, uh, to execute a flip. So how are we going to write this reward function down? Yeah. So, like, let's say it's trying to like do a loop around some center. Make sure like it always maintains the distance for the center, and that it's like the velocity that it is is like tangential to the way that it's rotating. So, like, just like emulate circular motion. Okay. So the the suggestion here is basically, um, I want to be here. I want 
you know, the robot to, or the helicopter to move like this. So I can write down this particular reward function by saying uh, you get points for basically con having velocity features that move you in this direction and points for state features uh, that have you moving out at some fixed distance. Okay, and this will, you know, it turns out that in this case there's just like a kind of fixed reward function for which... Uh, the sort of right long-term behavior is to move around. But, you know, what if we want to do some kind of more complicated trick that maybe looks like this? Uh, yeah? Polynomials. Polynomials, what does that mean? You can make a function and that uh, traces a specific path along the air and get a reward for being on that. Okay, good. So this is exactly right, but what's the catch? That's not a helpful question. The catch is, uh, if we specify our reward function by saying, here is a path for you to follow, then the reward is going to be changing over time. And the reward you get for being in the state at time t equals zero is going to be high, but the reward you get for being in the state when we actually want you to be done with the loop and be over here is going to be low. So we can fix a path. And then we can write down basically a changing reward function, a non-stationary reward function, and use that to solve our MDP instead. Um, you can go back and look at all your notes again and basically persuade yourself that even if we make this change to the normal MDP setup, all of the inference rules that we've been looking at before, the Bellman backup, all that, nothing is going to change. Um, and we just need to say some way of querying when I'm at time t, uh, what is my reward supposed to look, at, look like right now? Questions about how that works? Okay, good. So what we have here is some kind of target trajectory that we want to be able to follow. Uh, this is not updating. Uh, we have some target trajectory that we want to be able to fo follow, but we need to figure out what that target trajectory is. And so one kind of natural first thing that we could do is we could just say, you know, in the way that we were drawing on this slide before, um, what is the target trajectory? Let's just write it down by hand, right? Let's just sort of encode, say, this is the path that I want the robot to follow uh, for all of the state features at all time. And what happens when you do this is something like this. Where it starts out OK. And then becomes less OK as time goes by. The reason for this is that for all flips that you might write down uh, on a piece of paper, it's not guaranteed to be the case that those flips are actually physically executable, right? Some ways of doing this maneuver can actually be done using our model of the helicopter, and some of them can't. And so what we really need is, uh, you know, some way of kind of figuring out what the valid ways of executing this motion are, and it turns out our intuition about how this transition model works uh, is not good enough to just do this by hand. So one other thing we could do is we can say, well, it turns out this is something that humans are actually able to do reasonably effectively. That, you know, sort of skilled amateur fake helicopter pilots or whatever you call people who do this uh, can do all of these crazy tricks that we're trying to get our thing to execute. So why don't we just get some demonstrations from a human and use those to figure out what path we should be following instead. And so you put your sensors on the robot, you do your HMM inference, whatever, to figure this out. And so here are five or six different recordings of somebody piloting this helicopter. And they're trying to execute the same sequence of uh, four or five tricks in all of them. But you see that they pretty quickly get out of sync because, you know, in some cases the, the helicopters move too far or something or too fast. And so it turns out to be easy for people to do this, but hard for people to be able to do this reproducibly. And some of these trajectories are better than others, um, but they all basically do the thing that we're trying to do here. Okay, well this goes on for a while, but we don't need to keep watching it. So, what else is this data good for? We've talked about it already. Sorry? Training, right. When we are learning this transition function, when we're learning the dynamics model, the kind of data we need to estimate the dynamics model looks exactly like this, right? Where I know from my sensors that at time t I was here and at time t plus 1 I was here. 
So we can collect a bunch of these demonstrations. Um, and the problem is that these demonstrations are all different, and if we kind of look at the loops that they want to draw, sometimes they look like this, sometimes they look like this, sometimes they look like this. So if I'm just trying to kind of estimate a target uh, for where the helicopter is supposed to be at all time, and I average these things together, I'm going to get something that's totally nonsense because I'm taking a bunch of these nonlinear things and I'm, I'm smushing them together and I'm probably just going to get a like, you know, well, most of the time the helicopter was here and then it went up a little bit and went down. Uh, and so the average of these things will not necessarily look like uh, any individual one. So what we're going to need if we want to sort of learn a good trajectory from a bunch of human examples is some way of taking all of these sort of low quality examples that we've observed and cleaning them up and getting some kind of like good consensus. Here's really the target trajectory that you want the helicopter to execute. Um, and it turns out, I'm going to erase all of this, that we basically have all the tools to do this already. And it's going to look a little bit like HMM inference. So what I have here is I have demo one that says, you know, at some time the helicopter was here, some other time it was here, some other time it was here so on for demonstration one, and then we have another demonstration two, and they might not be time aligned, they might not even be the same length, right? But ultimately the same uh, sequence is getting executed. And what we imagine is going on here is that there's something that looks like an HMM, where I have a, a hidden sequence of true poses that are really what the helicopter pilot was trying to execute, and what I got to observe was their kind of noisy version of that, which was basically just a time distorted and maybe a little bit space distorted version of this uh, similarly. So what we can do is we can say, first let's just like, you know, maybe starting with the model that we wrote by hand without looking at any human data, specify here is a plausible target trajectory that the human was actually trying to follow. And here's the real demonstration. And then we're going to do something, uh, well, we're, and then we're going to do a two-step algorithm that actually looks a little bit like uh, what we were doing in the music case and a little bit like what we were doing in k-means. So what we're going to do first is we're going to say, okay, let's take each of these hidden poses and in all of the real demonstrations, figure out which of these real demonstrations we actually think, uh, uh, you know, when I'm seeing this frame, what frame of the underlying true plan did that come from? When I see this frame, what frame of the underlying true plan did that actually come from? Uh, and we're going to do that for all of the frames in all of the demonstrations that we have. How do we solve this inference problem? Let's suppose we didn't know that there was any kind of time piece of this, right? So I just have a bunch of different hidden poses, and I have a bunch of observed poses, and I'm trying to find the observed poses that kind of group together and look most like certain hidden poses. Yeah? Right, but I'm just trying to say, if I want to figure out, you know, which of the hidden states is this most like? Does that make sense? So basically, I'm saying what I actually observed here was a warped version of the underlying thing. And we're trying to go from this warped version and figure out frame by frame sort of where did the warping happen and what are the correspondences between frames of the demo and frames of the of the true plan. Yeah? Uh, using like some clustering algorithm? Like it, yeah, that's exactly right. It looks like clustering, right? Where kind of I imagine that these are my cluster centers, my prototypes for what should, things should look like, and what I actually get to observe are kind of noisy versions of those, and I'm trying to say, here are two frames that get grouped together, or, you know, here are uh, maybe two frames from the same demonstration that should get grouped together. It turns out that we can use something that looks very similar to k-means, but also takes into account the transition structure here, and the fact that this is really an HMM rather than just a bunch of independent things. And so that's one step of this inference algorithm, and it gives us an alignment between the hidden true demonstration and all of the real noisy demonstrations that we've actually been able to observe. So this is step one of the algorithm. And step two of the algorithm is going to say, OK, knowing that this is actually aligned to uh, you know, these two positions, that this is actually aligned to these two positions, and so on. Let's come up with better estimates for these hidden states based on the things that they're aligned to. And so now we might get something that looks like this. 
And we can go back and forth between these two steps. And overall, you can again think of this as some kind of hill climbing process like we were looking at for, for k-means or for the music thing. And eventually what we're going to wind up with is a really high quality alignment between uh, our hidden trajectory and the demonstrations. And it's not only aligned and tells us kind of how to reshape those demonstrations, but it also tells us what the kind of consensus version of the moves that we were trying to execute uh, was. Yeah. Or the states, right? We can take this state vector and treat it like the feature vector that we were using for k-means. Or we could define extra features if we wanted. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So when we do this, if we take all of our demonstra- Oh, yeah, sorry, question. Uh, in this example, why don't the outcomes point back to the backwards? Because if I intend to go forward, then I actually go forward. Right? That'll point back to my next right? Yes. So, um, that would be a reasonable thing to do, and you know we're making independence assumptions here just to make the inference problem easier. But yeah, in fact, you know we do expect that if people screw up, it will affect their future behavior, and that's not captured in this model. Um, it turns out it works reasonably well anyway. So if we take these, you know, basically the time warping that uh, these arrows give us, and we kind of take all of our instructions and we line them up against each other, we get demonstrations that now look something like this. And you'll notice here that this is much cleaner, right? They're all kind of executing the same trick at the same time. They're kind of staying in the same location in space. And that, you know, before what we saw was that as this video went longer and longer, the, all of the little trajectories diverged more and more, right? That the further we were out, uh, the less correspondence there was between them. And what we're seeing here instead is that, in fact, basically, you know, for the whole duration of, uh, of these demonstrations, they continue to do the same thing at the same time. Um, and what's cool is we actually take all of these and we look at the consensus trajectory that we get out by you know, sort of filling in what was actually along the backbone to generate all these noisy examples we saw. Uh, we see that the consensus demonstration, which is shown in black here, is much cleaner, much nicer than any of the individual demonstrations that we had to train off of, but is still going to have the property that it's actually kind of physically executable. Um, and so putting it all together, we get this. So that was totally under automated control just after watching like five or six human demonstrations of this sequence of actions. And you know how to do it. Um, yeah, so that's it for the helicopter demo. Do people have other questions about the helicopter demo before we move on to the next thing? So we'll talk about classes again at the end of today's lecture, but if you take CS287, uh, you will implement not on a real robot, but in simulation, this uh, trajectory, tra trajectory following behavior. And 
it's really exciting to, to watch the helicopter flip over, even on the screen. Okay, so one other robotics application that we want to look at here, which is uh, now not flying, but walking. So what we have is some kind of four-legged robot, uh, and our, you know, we have good control over the robot. We know how to say, if it's currently in this pose, and I want to move it to this pose where the leg is somewhere else, uh, what sequences of actions should we take? But what we're really interested in figuring out uh, what to make this do is if I put it on some kind of terrain, uneven terrain that it's never seen before, how does it figure out how to plant its feet in order to optimally get from one side of that terrain to the other one? And so again, this is some kind of complicated control problem uh, that we want to solve using, um, by, you know, by, sol by solving an MDP, essentially. Um, and so like we were looking at the helicopter, the handle we're going to have on this is to define some kind of reward function. And so once again, where's this reward function going to come from? Okay, so we can define a bunch of features on the current state and we can write down some weights for all those features, right? And this is basically what we did in the helicopter case before where we said, you know, what's your position from the target? What's your velocity? And then we're going to put a negative weight on all of those and it'll give out the right behavior for, uh, for the hovering. And for doing this loop thing, we just have features that look like that um, over the whole course of the loop. Are we going to be able to do this in quite the same way for this uh, walking case? Assuming you don't get to see what the ground looks like ahead of time. Yeah. Do we have sensors that can see the ground while walking? Yeah. Yeah. Why wouldn't we be able to Um, okay, so the key here is that in the helicopter, we kind of, we knew exactly what path it had to follow. And here we, you know, I don't know ahead of time where the rocks are going to be, so I can't write down a reward function that says at time t, your leg should be in this configuration and not in this configuration, uh, just by myself. Yeah? But if you want to do real-world tests, you also can't, uh, Exactly. So the question is, how are we, how are we going to set this problem up in such a way that um, we can use past experiences to figure out how to move in the future while just doing sort of normal MDP inference? Yeah. So just to walk across the rock. Just to walk across the rock, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. so, sorry, maybe this is too vague. I guess what I'm getting at here is that we kind of expect, you know, if we just say, here's a reward function that says, be as close to this as possible, um, it's going to be very hard for us to, by writing down rules by hand, specify, kind of get as far as possible, and also don't fall over, and also don't get yourself into positions that are stable now, but from which you will fall down in the future. Um, and we kind of have the same problem that we were looking at uh, with all this vision stuff before, right? Where it's going to be really hard for us to just write down rules that will uh, give us the right behavior out at the end of the day. And so what we want to do instead, and this is a little different from anything that we've done right now, is we want to define, we're, we're going to learn the reward function. So rather than doing reinforcement learning and learning a policy, we're going to try to learn a reward function from demonstrations instead. So I'm going to have a bunch of examples of people sort of doing remote control on this robot. Uh, and what we're going to try to get out is basically assume those people were acting out the optimal solution to some MDP, what was the reward associated with that MDP? Why is this maybe a better thing to do or an easier thing to do than uh, imitation learning directly, like we saw with Pac-Man? Anyone else who hasn't talked today? The question is, what's the, what's the advantage of specifying this behavior in terms of a reward function instead of directly memorizing a policy and not bothering with any of this MDP stuff at all? Yeah. 
Someone new, uh, newish, yes. Uh, what do you mean by there's no optimal policy? Okay, so the sequence of motions that I want to might want to execute is not going to be the same. But if I'm just learning a reflex behavior that says, here are the current states of the environment, where do I put my foot next without doing MDP inference? That'll also behave differently when I put it down in different environments, depending on the features I define, right? Okay, so just to spell it out, basically the key thing is that when I'm doing MDP inference, I'm planning, right? I can sort of reason about what the consequences of my actions are going to be very far in the future, and I can say if I know I'm going to get this reward at some far off state, I can do a lot of computation to figure out what sequence of actions I need to take to that, to get to that state where I'm eventually going to get reward far in the future. If I'm just learning some kind of reflex policy, then all I get is basically uh, here's what the world looks like now, and I have to immediately decide where to put my foot next without really getting to think about you know, what the long-term consequences of my actions are going to be. Um, so to the extent that I'm able to figure out how to do the right thing, it's because I have to be able to kind of memorize from every state what was the thing that I had to do next to get me the right behavior long in the future. This is a thing that we can get out of reinforcement learning algorithms sometimes if we have a sufficiently rich model class. But in this situation, you know, it's not going to have a chance to be walking around on the rocks many times, falling over, falling over, falling over, before it finally gets across, right? It has to do this right the first time. And so by trying to do the learning on the reward function and then running MDP inference, it can do a lot more kind of interesting look ahead long-term reinforcement or long-term um, reasoning behavior than if it was just learning some reflex policy instead. Uh, so this thing that we do here in terms of learning the reward function is called inverse reinforcement learning uh, because, you know, instead of learning the policy, what we're learning is the reward function and then the policy is just going to fall, fall out of that. Um, so uh, in particular, this is going to look, in the look like the following. We're going to get a bunch of demonstrations of paths across this terrain. We're going to do some kind of apprenticeship learning, which here we're trying to reproduce the, the reward function. Um, to figure this out. And then when I get a new testing terrain, um, I'm going to just be able to fire features on that. I'm going to define my reward in terms of features that look both at the state of the robot and the sort of configuration of the world into which the robot has been placed. Uh, and we're going to do MDP inference on the fly in this new environment. Uh, so here's what that looks like. If we try to set the weights by hand, it knows it's trying to get from one side to the other. But it can't really do it. Very sad. Um, if we instead do some demonstrations and allow it to learn a reward function from human behaviors, we get something that looks like this instead. Uh, and so it successfully makes it across. And so this is another kind of hard control problem that we're able to solve using a lot of the tools that we've looked at in this class, but that's kind of a generalization of what we saw with reinforcement learning and MDPs to the case where it's the reward function itself that you are trying to recover. Yeah? I feel like you could have it learn itself if it just had better repeat, that it wasn't sticking to this right at all. Um, okay, but like we have the robot that we're, that we're given, and... Uh, you know, at the end of the day, we want to be able to learn kind of policies generically and do the best we can for any kind of hardware. So, uh, uh, so that's the problem we're trying to solve. Another question? Okay. Yeah. Um, so how the the details of this are a little complicated, and I would encourage you to take a robotics class in the future if you want. But basically, you can set up um, uh, a learning problem that looks kind of like what we were doing before, uh, where you do perceptron-style updates that's basically 
what's the score of um, the path of the solution that my model prefers under the current weights? And what's the score of the demonstration provided by the human? And then update the weights in such a way that you try to prefer all of the human demonstrations to all other demonstrations. And so there's an update rule for this that looks a lot like uh, a kind of structured version of the perceptron update. It's kind of like yeah, exactly, exactly. So we're getting demonstrations, um, and it's just a question of what we do with this. Yeah. Um, can we extend this to a model where, say, like, I mean, so far, like the helicopter and this, like, a human has been able to control the robot and been able to get it across. Can we, like, apply, like, I guess, modify the technique so a human can almost do it, but like they can't get it across, but still try to pick up. Yeah, so I mean, there, you know, there's a whole range where you say, here's training data, get close to this, initialize with it, uh, and then maybe start doing reinforcement learning of your own and do a little more explanation or exploration uh, to kind of, you know, basically use humans to put you in the right part of the policy space and then explore around there. Um, yeah, I mean, this is something that people still really work on right now. And, you know, one thing that's especially important is we want... Um, we want things that are provably safe and we want to be able to get guarantees a lot of the time that like if there is some category of behavior that the humans are clearly afraid of uh, and never demonstrate that the robot will be able to learn without you know having to sort of see that failure mode a lot of times while doing reinforcement learning just to never do that right well, you have the example on the homework where the thing's trying to walk from one side of the bridge to the other and uh, sometimes it falls off the bridge into the fire uh, we would like for our robots to never fall off the bridge into the fire even when they're not quite certain about how the environment works and so this is a big big open research problem okay um, what we have left are a couple of slides of robots doing cool things, uh, which we may or may not have time to actually talk about, uh, but here's one. So this is the, uh, uh, the robot we have up on the seventh floor of Satarja Dai Hall. It knows how to fold laundry, among other things. Sorry? Uh, I think it's a little faster these days than 200x but not fast enough that you would actually want to use it. Yeah. Sorry? Unless you're really lazy and you don't generate a lot of laundry. Um, uh, so we've already looked at some kinds of apprenticeship learning. Um, so here's kind of like what you were talking about before, where we have a bunch of human demonstrations that are not demonstrations of quite what we want uh, because we're you know, ultimately going to be evaluated on some kind of uh, test situation that doesn't really look like any of the situations that we had at training time. Um, and so one thing that, you know, kind of comes up here practically uh, is we have this knot tying example. Uh, sorry, I'm moving through this really fast. But basically, suppose I have um, initially uh, a demonstration of how to tie, take a rope that starts out looking like this and tie it in an overhand knot. And then at test time, I'm given a new demonstration that looks like this. Uh, where the initial configuration isn't totally the same. I don't expect that the rope's going to be able to move in exactly the same way. Uh, we can do a similar kind of warping thing to the warping thing that we did with all these human demonstrations of, uh, of the helicopter motions, actually, and basically say, transform this demonstration that I had from the human into uh, a starting configure, you know, basically warp the initial configuration of the rope to the configuration of the rope that I'm faced with right now and use that warping, apply it to the motions themselves um, and, and basically transform the human demonstration and then just execute this transformed human demonstration. Uh, there's some math on the slide. Don't worry about it. Uh, it looks like this. So we're going to get a demonstration that looks like this. So there's a knot tied. And now we've given it some totally different looking rope. 
and it's going to try to execute just that same one demonstration that it saw before. And notice, right, that if it were kind of literally going through the same motions, it wouldn't grab the rope at all. It would totally miss it uh, and do something unpredictable. But by solving this transfer problem, it is able to successfully tie the knot by itself. And so it can do more complicated knots, uh, just very slowly. Uh, and those of you who are Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts in the room, I'm sure will be really fascinated by all this knot tying, but uh, that is enough. Um, uh, yeah, so that's it for kind of... Uh, demonstrations of advanced applications and things. And so we just wanted to wrap up today's lecture. Uh, oh man, do we have time for weird Pac-Man? Here's one weird, so there, here's just like a couple weird robotic applications of Pac-Man. Uh, this one is especially creepy. Uh, we get a bunch of cockroaches. Cockroaches? Uh, crickets. Uh, we get the crickets to operate the ghosts. So that if we vibrate the container in which the crickets are located, they will tend to move toward that vibration. And so we let a human player play Pac-Man um, uh, while vibrating the box underneath Pac-Man uh, to tell the crickets. Uh, I guess we drive them away from Pac-Man rather than toward Pac-Man by vibrating. But, so the ghosts are being controlled by crickets and, and Pac-Man by a person. The crickets don't really understand the rules. Sometimes they climb over the walls. <laughs> so the moral of the story is you are better at Pac-Man than crickets. Um, that's it. So this is basically the end of the course. Um, and what we've tried to give you in 188 is a sort of high-level overview of pretty much all of the different kinds of problems that we care about in modern AI. And so things about reasoning under, about, under uncertainty, things about planning, things about interacting in adversarial environments, and things about learning from experience. Um, and now that you kind of know at a very high level what the field looks like, um, there are many, many, many directions in which you can go next. Berkeley is basically the best place in the world to be doing AI right now. We have made way more people doing way higher quality work at many different kinds of things than, than most other places that you might consider. Um, and even you know, here, while you're here now, there are lots of classes that you can take um, that will kind of build on the things that we've done in this class. So at the undergraduate level, there's CS189 and STAT154, which focus and sort of drill down on the machine learning units that we've been doing just in the sort of last piece of this class. Um, a lot of what we do in AI, as you've seen here, uh, involves probability sort of in a general way. Uh, and so if you want to keep, doing, keep going in this, I would encourage you to take as many probability and statistics classes as you can right now. There are whole courses on optimization. Uh, if you're a cognitive scientist and you're interested in using these kinds of models uh, to figure out how they apply to human cognition or what we can improve about our models by using what we know about human cognition, uh, there are cog sci classes, there are theory classes where you're just doing math, and then there's all kinds of application areas. There's vision, there's robotics, there's language, uh, and, and many, many more things. So I encourage you all, uh, while you are here, to take advantage of the many wonderful resources uh, that Berkeley has for you. The other thing is um, uh, that lots of people love to get undergrads involved in research projects. And so if you like what you've seen here and you want to do it more in a kind of hands-on way, um, I encourage you to get set up with some kind of research group and you can come talk to us about you know, who, who the right person is to contact for your interests. Um, Davis and I, so uh, admin stuff. Office hours are happening as normal this week. Sections are happening, this nor happening as normal this week, uh, basically functioning as extra office hours. After the final exam is over, and we'll post these details soon, Davis and I are going to be hosting uh, additional office hours uh, to which you are encouraged to come, but at which you may not ask any questions about CS188 course material um, that are just about sort of informing yourself about AI in general and figuring out what steps to take next 
uh, if you want to take next steps. So here, Davis, come up since this is the very end. Um, but uh, yeah, we hope uh, this has been a good experience for you. We hope that you will continue to get in touch with us if you have more questions about how all this works. Uh, and we hope you all go out and, and do AI in the real world in the future. Uh, final thoughts? Oh, you said it pretty well. OK. Um, yeah. I, I have nothing to add to that. That's pretty good. <laughs>